What's up, everybody, and welcome to Indie Game Business. My name is Indy. That guy way over there is Jay, and he's got some coffee, which I don't have yet, which I should have soon. And in the middle, we've got Richard Ludlow. Um, hey. And he's got coffee, too. Oh, gosh, everyone's got Absolutely. coffee but me. I'm feeling it's running low, though, really so. terrible about this whole thing here. You, you need to low. work on your office stuff, Indy. That's that's just a I know. Well, I, a need a, I need a... Uh, what are those things called? What are those K-Pod machines? And, and just right here in the table next to me. And that's what I, I need. I had one of those, and then we got rid of it. I just absolutely, you know, felt horrible about what we were doing to the environment with those things. With the K-Pods? <laughs> yes. And I, I'm not like the most, you know, green hippie person in the entire world. But, you know, when you're dealing with something that we went through as many pods as we did, and there's literally no way to break those things down. I was like, you know what? It's probably not the uh, not the best thing. So now I just make pots of coffee and drink tons of it every day. <laughs> uh, anyway. Little, yeah. Welcome to the show, Richard. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, yeah. It's great to see an interest in uh, audio stuff. Well, and, and that's what we're going to talk about because there must be an interest in it because I get about a request a week from audio folks around the world wanting to know if we have, you know, projects for them to work on. So that's why I wanted to have you on. It's like to realize that, you know, there are a lot of options out there and how you separate that whole wheat from the chaff type thing. But we'll get to that. For so. Sure. We're going to start where we always start, which is always the fun part. Tell us how you got into the industry and then walk us through your career, because that I'm always interested to see how people ended up here. Yeah, for sure. Uh, a story tale lasting decades. No, just kidding. Um, yeah, you know, I was in school, uh, wanted initially to do like film scoring, but immediately discovered uh, that writing music for video games was like a thing. And uh, along that way, discovered sound design for video games and realized I was not nearly as good as a composer as uh, other colleagues and <laughs> fell in love with the sound design aspect. And um, anyway, so it kind of was this, oh, I love game music and then really got into game sound. And then while I was at school, I uh, kind of got together with uh, a group of friends and um, Juan Cortez and Richard Gould and then Andy Forsberg and we all kind of were interested in uh, pursuing you know something we could work together at it was more of a creative collective initially and then um, you know after graduating it became a company and so um, <laughs> essentially uh, now I you know I had done some game audio internships at game developers I had done a number of internships and the ones I did specifically at game developers like Heavy Iron out here in LA uh, were it was an amazing experience with them and so that I knew that was what I wanted to do so the company um, our company Hexney Audio kind of evolved um, somewhat organically in that regard but then has just kind of grown since then as we've gotten more clients hired more people um, there's 13 of us now um, so yeah it's a it's um, been a good ride but you know we're focused very much on the game music and sound design, audio integration, programming, and um, and also voiceover for games to a lesser extent. But they're kind of all encompassing. In a world games. where there's voiceovers <laughs> for games. Exactly. Like this. Exactly. Um, so I, I'm curious, tell us some of the games that you worked on. Uh, um, I know that there's quite a few. The, uh, I'm looking I gotta at pull up wiki. the list and see what I can, yeah. can, can what's announced. <laughs> Let's announce uh, Monster Hunter Online. That's pretty yeah, we cool. Yeah, did, we did a little uh, like uh, music production stuff for that. Yeah, um, initially done the original Disney Infinity and like the Family Guy game. Um, our company's done. Uh, uh, we did the new King's Quest reboot that happened a couple of years ago from Activision. More recently, last year we were doing like Overwatch music for their like tournaments for their esports tournaments. Um, we do a ton of stuff for Arena of Valor which is like the most popular game in China. And given that it's the most popular game in China, it's the most popular game in the world because they have the most people. So, <laughs> they um, win. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah, we, we do theme parks as well that utilize, you know, game engines, did some stuff for Universal, um, other theme parks out here. So um, I'm sure I'm forgetting a bunch of things. Last year we did the, uh, 
Blade Runner Revelations VR experience, the Jurassic World VR experience. Oh, um, we do a qu quite a bit of VR. Um, yeah, um, and we do trailers as well for games. So like the Assassin's Creed Syndicate, like release trailer stuff. Um, bunch of different, you know, variety. I'm pulling up the oh PUBG. We've been doing a lot for PUBG in the last year for like the mobile version. Um, different, you know, a lot of sound design for that. Uh, H1Z1. Mm, right, so, and other so things. <laughs> this is fascinating for me because I will admit, even though I've been doing this for 20 years, sound and audio has escaped my view. You keep talking about sound design. Mm -hmm. For those of us who are completely and utterly ignorant, what is sound design? For sure, yeah. I mean, music, voiceover, those are pretty easy to like distinctify that's a word um sound is pretty much everything else so right it's your gunshots your footsteps your <clears throat> spells laser blasts environmental ambiences i think distinctify sounds. is a george bush word isn't it distinctify i, I wouldn't <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't know ask okay. me a couple times maybe i'd say yes maybe <laughs> i'm just messing with you okay, okay. so how but, do you um, go yeah. Go, go ahead, finish up. Oh, no, no, that, you know, it's it's pretty much everything else that you're hearing. And then um, as part of sound design, very frequently, we're also asked to do the implementation into the game. And, you know, so that would be putting the assets we create, like, into perhaps an audio middleware like Wise, and then putting those into Unity or Unreal, either, you know, uh, scripting, C Sharp, or Blueprints if it's Unreal, or C++. So we do all of that, and that's often kind of bundled as part of a sound designer's role in video games wow that's a, a lot of stuff plus voiceovers yes yes um yeah definitely we do do that to a little bit of a lesser extent but everybody at our company has a specialty you know with 13 people we've got a few composers a couple of technical people people more focused on um, sound obviously so it's kind of everybody has their specialty nice so for the for the indie teams out there that don't mm -hmm. you know have 13 people and, and, you know, decade plus of experience doing this. Do you get, so when we're talking like gunshots and, and spells going off and footsteps and all that sort of stuff, is there a, a library that you all have internally or are there resources out there where they can get that audio? Cause I see people all the time on Reddit and they're like, Hey, I was bored in Venice and recorded a bunch of ambient sound, you know, where where do you actually pull the sounds? Do you go out and, and, and get them yourselves or is it internal or? Yeah, how, every how project is a little different and it also depends on what the client wants. You know, larger clients, they want often 100% original recorded stuff. And so we have to go record everything and uh, or synthesize it from scratch. Uh, but in a normal project, we will use a combination of one, commercial libraries of which we have, you know, a number of licenses for, for many of those to our own internal libraries that are custom that we're always kind of developing and adding to and three custom recorded stuff for the project. So usually a project is a hybrid of those three things. Um, but again, it totally depends for, you know, uh, a, a non-audio person looking to go and get sound and put it in their game. Uh, you know, free sound, I know people go there, that's like definitely a scary resource. Um, you know, you can buy sound libraries, but there's also sites like like SoundSnap, um, which to be fair, I don't have like vast amount of knowledge about their licensing models and everything, but I believe they're like predicated on the fact that, hey, we have a million like high quality sounds, you pay a subscription, which is pretty nominal, and download whatever you want, whenever you need it, and use it in your game. Again, not certain about their licensing, so definitely look at that yourself. But, you know, there are these subscription model sites that I think are a better resource for people needing piecemeal content, um, like an indie developer. So is the, you know, when the bigger studios, you know, the Ubis and the PUBGs and all this of the world won't, wholly original content is that a quality thing or a ownership thing or is it a bit of both it depends um i think it's a quality thing and an ownership thing and if i had to pick one it's an ownership thing yeah um, you know there's a once you get working with a lot of 
studios, there's lots of attorneys involved with contracts and, and it's policy that got to own 100% of it, got to be, you know, whatnot. Um, so I think it's it's a bit of both. Um, for the higher, you know, for, for when you're working with a, like a, a AAA project with their audio team, then it's usually like a quality thing because they would want it regardless. But, uh, you know, if you're you're just talking with a production team and they don't have an internal video team, you know, maybe you're negotiating with their outsourcing partner to connect you with a, you know, an internal studio and they don't have internal audio, then it's a legal thing. So it just kind of depends. Do you, do you like go out and um, they're like, we want gunshots for all of these different kinds <laughs> of weapons? Do you like go out and re out there recording with like a the mic with the big fuzzy thing on it and standing out in the we wind? We did have the, the big fuzzy thing in the mic and we go and record. Yeah, and, mm. and la recording is also an art unto itself. So we have, you know, people here who are great at that, but also like gunshot recording, vehicle mm. recording. These are like specialized arts. So there's like a guy, Watson Wu, he's like a, a genius at that. And that's like his specialty. And so we've had clients as well approach us and be like, hey, can, can you hire Watson? And then we don't have to set him up as a vendor or whatnot, you know, and and um, and then so we, you know, we went out um, last year uh, to a session that Watson put together just to kind of watch him work his magic. And then we took those assets and, um, you know, kind of uh, put them in game, you know, re uh, designed, remastered, kind of re, um, you know, made them work lined them up to animations etc so we will definitely do that but you know that's a that's an art that some people are better at um so yeah or like the foley the guy where you see the movies and then there's somebody in there and, and they've got be quiet alexa stop alexa stop <laughs> where they're out there and they're like they're clanging things together and they're like digging their hands through stuff you, you guys do that kind of audio recording as well we do, yeah, yeah. Um, I know I walked in on Jason yesterday and he had like an old camera that he was recording um, different like mechanical sounds for. So it's definitely, yeah, definitely things that we do. Um, folding is, you know, usually seen as, I think the definition of Foley, which is now just pretty much applied to anything like human made sounds, but the definition is like performed live to picture. So the idea was, oh, you watch like a, a cinematic and you kind of perform the Foley live, which makes it a bit faster sometimes for things like clothing and footsteps then faster than kind of cutting all that manually if you're just kind of performing it in sync with the picture. But um, yeah, definitely things we do. That's neat. The, the, this yeah. is the, the always the, the fascinating part. It's like, you know, where did that sound come from? This alien gurgle, you know, and, and you read these stories on somebody like put cellophane over a toilet and flushed it and then remixed it. And that's how, you know, and, and th that always amazes me that somebody can sit down and go, Oh, well, it should sound like this. So I need to take, you know, the garbage disposal and run that while I'm drinking orange juice. And it's going to create this unique sound. That's just cellophane over a toilet. We're doing that later today. It's going to happen. That's in the schedule. <laughs> With a contact mic, you know, right on the cellophane, you've inspired me. It's going to be great. <laughs> so, where are, so, so going, you know, getting back to the actual topic today, other than how you record random shit. Um, audio, it, it's become such a absolute key part. And, you know, to me, it goes all the way back to, you know, things like Doom. You know, because the way that you got a little bit better than, than somebody else at Doom and Quake, and especially in shooters, is you could hear them pick up a weapon and you knew where that weapon was in the map, so you knew where they were and that, and that sort of stuff. How have you seen the industry change during your career in terms of complexity? And like you said, you everybody has their specialty, mm -hmm. which is something you see now that you didn't really see 10, 15 years ago. Very How true. has the industry changed that much? in your career? You know, obviously I haven't been doing this for decades, relatively uh, young, but I think the biggest shift I've seen has been the introduction of VR and how it has altered how people are designing and implementing sounds um, in both VR projects and non-VR projects. You know, the scope of what that's introduced has changed the way we do certain things. For example, uh, in VR, 
it's very important that audio be properly spatialized so players know sound is emanating here, 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 uh, you know, the rear, the elevation, those are very important things to kind of draw a player's attention to where it needs to be uh, visually and, and audio is one of the key ways that people do that. And in order to properly spatialize your audio in the rear and uh, with height mapping and elevation, you need to use usually a type of HRTF, Head Related Transfer Jump Function, um, algorithmic spatializer that takes your sound and does this simulated, you know, what would it sound like if this was behind you or above you? It essentially tries to make sound more positional. In a more traditional, uh, you know, game that's not using a spatializer, if you take a sound and you put it here or you put it here, it's pretty much... You know, left and right's easy, but once you kind of get this going, it's much more difficult to tell. And so these spatializers aim to really increase that uh, ability to perceive where things are coming from. The problem with them is they can be high, uh, you know, very CPU intensive. They can be um, not sound great a lot of the time. So we've actually changed the way we do a lot of sound design in terms of... Um, breaking things apart into this almost like multi-dimensional spatial layered approach so if you were to have a cannon shooting at you from like off to the side in a traditional game that's like an asset and it's going uh, but in a vr game or now even in first person shooters people are doing this to help increase you know just like you said the the knowledge of where enemies are and whatnot nowadays we might break that into a layer that's in the spatializer that's small so people know where it is and then another layer that's still mono but 3d and anchored in the world and spatialized but not in the spatializer because sometimes the spatializer does this transient smearing and then another layer that's you know 2d or quad for low frequency energy so kind of there's a lot more time spent on these things i think wow. i understood like the first sentence of that and it's then, okay <laughs> and then it got like complete science aspect sorry <laughs> no that's, I don't think it's, it's science. awesome we're, we're dumb audio people but you because know we've, we've had to learn <laughs> that is exactly the thing that a lot you know a lot of folk thank you elsa can you specialize her snoring over here to my um to my right well she's off to your right so you're pretty good the use yeah. of a specializer there would only be necessary <laughs> if she kind of runs around behind you but she is kind of lower down so the elevation there you know you're not going to get that perceived <laughs> Oh, that's gosh. funny so glitch vision says the fun part is very small independent studios who make games exclusively for the blind have been using spatial audio for a few years before vr even came out and that spatial sound is important for people with low or even no vision to play i mean i imagine somebody yeah. that has low or no vision could probably play some vr games because everything is so spatial yeah you know i uh We've had clients who are like, the goal here is you can play this game with your eyes closed. And so um, whether or not we've achieved that, I don't know. But I, I certainly do think there are experiences that have gotten a lot better for sure because of that and made things more accessible. And I know that like there's actually people doing research and, you know, testing of this and creating games specifically for that. I am very ignorant as to that field but um it's great that they're doing that well there was an article that we i think we talked about it when tara was on about the guy who's blind but plays call of duty the zombie version of it and when they asked him they said you know how do you how and he said you line up the all he said i aim with the audio he said yeah. if, the, if i can hear the zombie groan and it's equidistant then it's right in front of me and i shoot it and that's amazing that it, it, it is amazing. It's it's amazing that, you know, we've gotten to the point with technology that we can actually do that and for sure. you know, make it that easy for not that it could be easy, but, you know, make it so that that's even a an option. Yeah. <laughs> Coach Vision said, I know the person that was interviewed for that article, but, you know, and, and that's just absolutely, you know, fascinating. So, so how much of this comes down to the software involved and how much of it comes down to you know the, the absolute skill and knowledge of the audio engineer i would say definitely more the latter you know? um well i'll qualify that i don't think you need spatializers to make great sounding games by any means i do think things like 
audio middleware specifically we use a lot of wise wwise from audio kinetic um that is a huge boon to a game but only in the hands of someone who knows what they're doing with it um and you know the ability to create more advanced dynamic audio driven systems um, if you have a tool like wise is much more accessible than it was you know 10 years ago when number one wise was super expensive and number two um most people were using proprietary engines at larger studios and now that people are using unity real there it's a bit more ubiquitous and um you know now it is more the tools are there how do we just use them and you know i, I think a lot of indie developers are initially scared away by using audio middleware wise but um they've they've definitely come down in price and even in the you know they'll they'll work with you if your budget doesn't fit into the like exact things they have on their website they're happy to work with you they have a royalty model as well for indie devs they have a free license so i think you know using a tool like wise or fmod or fabric fabric um, is is very beneficial to to most games so long as you have someone who knows what they're doing again you need someone who knows what they're doing that's that's always going to be the key part so when a client comes to you and walk us through how you approach, you know, the various aspects of, of what they need. You know, obviously with something like Assassin's Creed or, or Monster Hunter Online, it's going to be a much bigger in-depth, you know, process. But, you know, when they come and they say, you know, we need a, a score, we need, you know, sound design. What are the questions that you ask? How do you, you know, get that ball rolling in order to get a good feel for what they want mm -hmm. and you know then actually play that out into the product yeah music and sound are, are very different approaches here obviously and people kind of come to us for um our, our main composer here is matthew and a lot of approach us for his music um or other composers on our team like jason or Ovi or steven um but and then sound people usually just come to our company for as opposed to an individual and then you know so maybe looking at sound first um, some people have a very clear idea of what they want they've got asset lists they've got video captures and we just kind of blow through assets and kind of hand them over um, our preferred way to work and what we do with a lot of projects and what if we are doing indie projects we're usually working this way is, and, and large projects too but usually we can convince the indie developers, no problem to let us do this, is you know just having access to their repo, SVN, Git, Perforce, whatnot. And so we will be you know just set up in there, we'll go through, we'll play the game, get gameplay captures, and just make sound and um, put it in. And so this is a new you know kind of distributed development model that audio studios have traditionally not really been a part of. Um, you know, in the past, uh, it was, not seen that audio was working in this distributed dev format where they were, you know, set up with source control. They were either in-house or kind of just handing assets over the wall. And so this this new way enables us to essentially talk with the developer, say, if you don't know what your game needs, let us just take a look, kind of buy a package from us, maybe you buy a couple hundred assets, we'll open up the game, we'll go find the best couple hundred assets, you know, to give you the best bang for your buck, you know, and um, and then we'll just make it all and put it in. So that's that's a one method. So you know, when dealing with an an outsourced company like you all, mm -hmm. when do they need to approach you? I mean, is it? I mean, obviously, earlier is better. But if it's too early, then you don't have access to the video capture, and things may change along the line. You know, for sure. What's the yeah. best way for them to approach that? It's a good question. I, um, you know, we don't charge anymore if you approach us earlier. And I feel like that's sometimes a, a, a thought, oh, let's wait, because we won't have to pay for as much time. We prefer to base our pricing um, not on like hourly what we're doing on the project, because then we find people doing that. <laughs> um, so it's, uh, I would say, earlier the better to approach us but then we'll maybe tell you let's wait six months before we begin get us in your slack ping us if you have questions we'll set up wise we'll get things going 
but let us wait to actually make the content until things are a little further along. Because sometimes it is better to wait to make the content until the end when animations are locked and um, you know things are more finalized. But I still think it's significantly better to be brought on early, make sure the foundation is set up for the project. Because if you you know build your whole game and then you realize oh we didn't leave any room for <laughs> audio in our memory budget, which was you know more of an issue in the past with with console games though. Um, for example, with console games, we'll, we'll definitely be brought in, sometimes temp a game in terms of we have like these click files that's just like varying lengths of silence, and we'll just throw them in to artificially bloat a memory budget so that people know approximately how much audio is going to be used up uh, in memory. And this has been helpful because when we haven't done that, sometimes, you know, art and everything has just gobbled up the memory budget. And then we've come in with audio and they're like, oh, we only have two megs left. We're like, okay, we're screwed. So um, <laughs> you're you're gonna get a lot of pings. That's about it. <laughs> yeah, a lot of exactly. So um, yeah, it kind of the method kind of depends. But I say approach early, and then you know listen to your audio person if they say we should wait to start. All right. So and, and there you you brought up another aspect of all of this that I had never thought of as well. You know, we're used to at least I am anyway looking at budgets in terms of localization and text. And, you know, mm. we know the tricks to go to make sure that, you know, whatever you're going to have, if it's a label for something, it's going to fit on the screen in German, just the same as it fits on the screen in English. How do you go about, you know, as, as a small developer, how do you go about figuring out how much budget you need to set aside for the memory, memory budget set aside for sound? For sure, yeah. Um, to talk to music first, music is a lot more variable. We've had developers who have approached us and they have like a hundred levels in their game maybe, but they're like, we only want one minute of music. Fuck it if the player hears that one minute of music for the next 10,000 hours. And we're like, you know, <laughs> it's up to you. If you want us to have do that one piece of music, great. But music is so variable. You know, if you have any amount set aside, to, I mean, not any amount, but I mean, like you can play with, you know, great. You've got enough for 20 minutes. You've got enough for three minutes. You've got enough for literally one minute and you will, your players will hate you, but you can do it. So it, um, you know, there's a lot of variability there. Sound a little bit less so because, you know, that needs a sound. Clearly that needs a sound, that needs a sound. But there still is a bit of elasticity in terms of how deep you want to go. So frequently I like to ask, you know, developers, you know, what are you setting aside? You know, this is kind of what I think it'll be. What have you set aside? We can make it work within that potentially. And then there's also different deals, be they work for hire where you're buying out assets, exclusive licenses where, you know, maybe you get like three years of exclusivity on the music or sound, uh, you know, non-exclusive meaning we can take and then, you know, resell those tracks or gunshots to somebody else. So there is a fair bit of elasticity, but if you're looking at percentages, um, I think a lot of, you know, teams, I say five to 15% would be a good amount to set aside. Honestly, we work on a lot of projects where it's less. Uh, usually the bigger the budget gets for the project, bigger chunks go to marketing. And so five to 15 might seem insane for those types of projects when they're spending millions on marketing. But on a small team that has, you know, a relatively modest budget, five to 15, I think is a good umbrella starting point if your game needs more absolutely it could be more maybe it needs a little less just depends so 50 percent that's the answer 50 percent right? yes 50 percent <laughs> exactly 50 percent music 50 percent sound you're good <laughs> so you know the next question you know when you were talking about budget obviously is what do these things cost you know mm -hmm. you know and what's the difference because like I said, there are a lot of sound options out there. Mm -hmm. How, so, so one high level, obviously what's a budget going to run, but then two, when you're faced as a developer with so many choices and so many people coming and going, Hey, I'll do audio for your game and I'll do a score for free. And how do you qualify a good audio team? It's a good question. Um, yeah, to, to, 
to pause the budget thing and address the good audio team question first. No, the majority of people in the game audio industry are freelancers. There are not a lot of companies like ours. Um, you know, the, there are a few, of course, but the vast majority are freelancers. And I think that's a great option for uh, a number of teams, you know, a dedicated person that's almost in-house, but is, you know, potentially remote for an indie team. Um, sometimes you get the idea that you want to find one person who can do your music and sound, and some people are great at that, but I think there's a lot of times mistakes made where someone will approach a composer and be like, I love your music. Oh, do you also do sound in the composer? I see this all the time in the audio forums. People are like, oh, I just got asked to do sound design for a game. Guess I'm going to say yes. Never done it before, but figure it out, which is understandable. And like, uh, we've all been there, but I would say think twice about having your composer and your sound designer be the same person, unless you know that they're good at that. You know, if they're just a composer, let them be what they're good at and considering having two people. Um, for our company, we obviously have both and it's nice to be able to collaborate. And oftentimes, if you approach a composer, they'll say, I work with this sound designer frequently or vice versa. So um, thought there. <laughs> as far as actual budgets go, um, we prefer to usually bill on like a content basis. And usually this is like a per minute music fee or a per asset sound design fee. When working with um, larger clients, with indie clients, we'll often do just a package deal. We'll look at the game. We'll say, we think this needs about, I don't know, an hour music, whatever it may be, and then just kind of say, great, we'll do the game for X amount. So this is totally variable, but you know, music rates can vary any way, anywhere a minute to, you know, thousands of dollars per minute. You know, I think a lot of people uh, have said for many years, there's this like thousand dollar a minute kind of an, an average, you know, some people are a little less, some people are more. Triple A's being around two thousand, three thousand dollars a minute for music. Again, this is all conjecture. I'm just putting out some things that people say all the time. This also depends on what's your type of license deal. Is it a work for hire buyout? Is it a non-exclusive? Does your composer get to keep soundtrack, you know, sale rights? So it's very variable um, on that side. Sound is a little more cut and dry sometimes. You know, if you've got a per asset model. Frequently, we also like to have people purchase like a package, you know, they'll just kind of buy, well, great, we want 300 assets, and then we just use them up as we go. And if you were to buy 200 or 300 or 400, you know, we're like Costco, the more you buy, the cheaper the, the per unit price is. Um, but it's so variable. Again, I think the 5 to 50 percent of total budget is a, is a fair assessment. And it sounds like it's more, and it makes sense, bid to the client, not the job. Because if you have like yeah. a, an indie studio that has four people working there, their budget's not going to be. But if it's some AAA game studio that has 300 people working or, or whatever, you bid to what the client is, not necessarily the job. And that makes sense in a lot of uh, a lot of different industries. Sure. Yeah. And the one thing I always tell people is like, you know, we might bill per asset, right? And so say we charged like $100 a gunshot and you bought that gunshot. Maybe that that gunshot, it is definitely maybe not definitely maybe not <laughs> worth a hundred dollars in and of itself. Intrinsically, the value of that one asset might not be worth a hundred dollars. But with us, we're selling for content, as are many people. We don't charge separately for meetings or for getting set up with your Perforce repo or you know, chatting with you on Slack five times a day because the gunshot isn't playing back or revising the gunshot a bunch of times or, oh, look, that animation changed. Okay, we'll update the timing on that. And, oh, yes, you need to do a call with your, uh, you know, investor so they know who the audio person is. Like, if you're not billing hourly, I very always caution, don't think about the intrinsic value of that asset. That footstep is not worth $100, but our time as a whole troubleshooting because you gave us the wrong ip address for your repo like four times and we try to download it for like hours that's what we're billing for <laughs> so yeah so it's basically like every other aspect of the <laughs> exactly but if you start saying, saying oh these people are charging a hundred dollars a step you're like oh my god that's insane he must but be wearing uh, a gold shoe yeah. exactly so yeah think All about that too
it, it's always one of my suggestions when people are like, I'm going to consult and, or I want to be a freelancer and how should I charge? And I tell them when I first started doing this, there's no like guideline on it. You know, it, it, it's like, okay, do you charge $50 an hour or $500 an hour? I said, you know, I used a thing called toggle that just plugged into Chrome and yeah, yeah. you literally click it when you're getting ready to do something and you track your time. Yeah. You will be shocked how much time you spend on something, you know, without worrying about it. I mean, without even thinking about it. It's like, oh, oh I'm yeah. going to do some emails for a client and you click it. And when you start tracking, it's like, oh my, over a week, I spent like two hours emailing, even though they were all like little, just like quick emails going off and, and you know, things like that. And so it, it is, and it's unfortunately one of the hardest things for people to understand because mm -hmm. they do, they look at it at like, what are you talking about, man? That's like a gunshot, one gunshot, and you're going to charge me a hundred dollars. <laughs> like, yes, yeah. but you know, there are other things that go into it. You know, that's like sure. your, your experience factor and all that kind of good stuff as all well. All the mics that we bought and the this and the, yeah. And, and you know, and the, the, the experience the, and the knowledge. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. You know, and then being able to, you know, do it right the first time or the second time, not the like 10th time. And that's key. That is yeah. absolutely key. Not just with audio, but with anything. It's like when mm -hmm. you look at a, you know, a resource that you're using and it's super expensive versus somebody else who's willing to do it for, you know, 10% of the cost. It's like, okay, that's fine. But mm -hmm. then, you know, track that and see how much time you spend up going and, and going back and forth on revisions and for sure you know, changes and well, the quality wasn't what I wanted it to be and, and that mm -hmm. sort of stuff. It, it adds up. And so, yeah. yeah, I mean, we realize we're sensitive to the fact that not everybody has, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars to drop in, you know, a game budget, but, you know, with any outside resource, you got to factor in, you know, are they going to get it right the first time? Do they know what mm -hmm. they're doing? Or are you going to have to hold their hand, you know, the entire time around? So, yeah. And I prefer to charge our clients more and then not nickel and dime them at all. Like we just had a client yesterday who's like, oh, we decided to put a game to uh, Oculus Quest, and which runs Android. And we're like, okay, sure, we'll go set up the Android banks for you. It'll take us like an hour to get that, you know, functional. We're not billing separately for that because like, oh, great, we'll send you an invoice for $100 or, you know, whatever. Yeah, we just exactly. bundle it all in, you know, otherwise people, they start to hate you and... <laughs> But the time tracking thing is interesting because, you know, oftentimes with games, we're working on projects for years. And so we have done the thing where um, a client really wanted a weekly rate or an hourly rate. And so we agreed to do for four months an hourly billing um, and we use toggle and we'd go into a meeting with like four people here. And I'd be like, all right, everybody buy your hit the toggle button billing times four you know like and we'd all wait you know be so annoying but at the end of four months we had a pretty good idea of what we were putting into the project time wise and we were able to then go back to the client and say over the last four months here was our average per month let's just make this a monthly fee that you will pay for the next three years and we'll do whatever you want and that's what we've been doing for the last three years on that project so um that's worked out really well um you know if you use that as like a basis to decide um you know you can yeah. have toggle on your phone. You can. Yeah. All right. Yep, yep. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm I love how that was right the takeaway. I'm, I'm doing <laughs> it right now. <laughs> it it it. You don't realize, like I said, you know, you just absolutely don't realize how much time you spend doing some stuff. Yeah. And and it's and it, you know, that's a great example because it's even better when you can, you know, go back to the client and go. You know, I, I'm not just estimating that we spent 15 hours a week on this. I mean, here are the here's the actual yep. spreadsheet, you know, sure, of, yeah. of data is a wonderful, wonderful thing. Yeah. Um, all right. So we got you know, Richard's got a roll. We're going to cap this one at an hour. Oh, and wow, so we got about 15, 20 minutes left. If you've Last got thing questions I'll also add too is if you go to, you know, I can throw a link in here and you guys can share it. We um we have on our website it's like in a private link so you'll have to see it here one sec um a bunch of game audio agreements that people just kind of distribute throughout the industry that our attorney put together that we turned into these templates with his blessing and they kind of released and now they're like the game audio network guild contracts and everything but there's like a non-exclusive license that's great for indie projects there's a work for hire template 
Um, so I, I just threw over the link to you guys and you can put it up there, but feel free to go there, download them, look at them, use them. They're, they're very fair contracts, I think, for both parties, both the game developer and the audio person. And they're a good starting point for a lot of negotiations, um, you know, so I think better contracts being used by everyone in the industry is a good thing all around. So take them, do what you will with them. Dude, that's awesome. And yeah, I yeah. will put that up on our Discord in our little free resources area. Do it. Yeah, they're not perfect, but you know they're a great starting it's point. Starting we point. use them as the starting point, uh, a very similar one for most all of our negotiations. Um, yeah. That's fantastic. For awesome. sure. Thanks for yeah, that. Yeah, well, thanks so much for having me. Oh, we're not done yet. I was just giving everybody oh, the shit. warning. We're not oh, going to kick. We're not going to let you go that easy. Okay. All right. Okay. So if. If you have questions, toss them up in chat. You know, we'll answer them. Where, so Richard, where do you see smaller teams and even bigger teams? I mean, the biggest, where, what's the biggest problem, the biggest mistake that they usually make when they're attacking the audio side of their game? It's a good question. That's a very good question. So many places to start. Just kidding. <laughs> so um, many fuck ups. There's just like so many. <laughs> No, no. Um, th this one is popping into my mind, but it's certainly not the biggest by any means. <laughs> but I'm going to share it anyway. Um, we see semi-frequently that uh, indie developers more so uh, will find a composer that they love and another composer that they love and another composer that they love and hire all three of them and throw them and be like, we hired all three of you. I love all of your music. Now my game will have amazing music from the three of you. And I, I, this can yield great results. And on some games, it yields amazing results. But in my experience, it makes it difficult to craft, for the composer to craft their vision for the game. And it also instills a certain level of like, is doing this is it going to be cohesive and I, i've seen this more and more in the last year and a half certainly not the biggest mistake but it's something that's sometimes not great and i just caution you if you find several people whose music you love to hire them all and throw them into a room on slack and say score my game <laughs> <laughs> um yeah definitely not the biggest mistake i'd say the biggest mistake is forgetting about audio until the last minute and um, just forgetting about it entirely and then realizing it needs it. Oh crap, oh crap, we need sound. Pretty much, that happens all the time. So just because you like strawberry ice cream and hamburgers and pizza doesn't necessarily mean you need to throw them all in one bowl and then sure. eat it. And I'd also recommend, you know, there's a lot of people out there wanting to be composers, wanting to be film composers, but there's a lot of people wanting to be game composers. If you're making a game, find a game composer. Like, all the time I meet these film composers who are like, oh, I hear there's a I don't really give a shit about games. Like, we only do games. We only care about games. There's a million people out there who only care about games. Go find those people. They're going to do a better job because they're going to understand your medium more. Even perhaps more than someone whose music is better. Someone who's more passionate about games and understands what's going on there. Don't hire your cousin's band. You know, there's so many games... <laughs> hungry composers and sound designers those are the people you should find i think um yeah so i mean can we safely assume it's like a lot of other you know outsourcing research you not only want to find you know people or companies who do games but you also want to find similar genres or styles as well yeah you know i do think um it's great to find someone who's in the niche of what you're looking for. But I also find frequently that clients will be like, oh, you can't do that style. And I'm like, we've absolutely done that style. It's just not on our website. You know, if you find a composer whose other music you love, reach out to them. You know, we tell people, yeah, we're not great at that. Um, but, you know, I, I, I do feel like there are a lot of false assumptions sometimes given in terms of like, oh, you can't do that. That's not your style. But even if they haven't done it often, the result might be very good. Um, you know, people get slotted into their, this is what I do well, and then they get hired for that game and that game and that game and that game again. And then people think, oh, you can only do horror music because the last 50 games you've done. But they might be able to be right amazing, you know, fantasy music too, so. 
Just saying. It's amazing how much variance there is out there. Because, I mean, it, music is one of those things that can either make or break because you end up either turning it completely off or you simply remember the wonderful, you know, opening score when you play a game and it brings back memories and, and you know, all of that sort of stuff. How much has it amplified the need for, for great sound since, you know, for the last, I guess, five or 10 years now, we've started having orchestra concerts and everything that are, that are playing, you know, music from games. And it's like one of the things that really stuck out to me during the game awards back in December was, you know, when they had like the composer from Celeste that was up there on stage playing the playing, you know, her score with the orchestra. I mean, with, yeah, Lena's awesome. You know, with all of that that's come up I, I say recently, but it's not recently. How has that impacted, you know, this side of the industry as a whole? Yeah, I think it's brought a lot of recognition to our field and our art absolutely so that's that's great you know i think scientifically audio has a more emotional tie than say a visual element you know there's a fairly direct path from what you see in a visual stimulus to like the visual processing center in your brain i've been told because who the fuck knows but um no dude that makes uh, sense that actually makes sense because you can watch something and you're like and eh, it's you know there's some emotion to it but then you have this amazing score that like takes you on this this emotional journey and you're like just in tears and and it's it's just the music it's the music yeah and i think the scientific reason is like you know audio stimulates on the way to the audio cortex processing center of your brain it stimulates these emotional processing centers in ways that visual don't again smarter people than me have told me this so who knows but i you know i've taken <laughs> that and i believe that you know audio music sound are emotional component during a horror movie i just plug my ears if i'm scared you know um, and so you get scared of horror movies, I, you know, <laughs> you know. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so I think it's, uh, that emotional aspect sticks with players l long outside the game and does, you know, lead to these, you know, standalone performances and, you know, applicability of music outside and people remembering your game and branding your game, you know, like the iconic sound effects in so many Nintendo games and other games, you know sound of the xbox 360 boot up logo like these are all things that we inherently know and that are used to kind of brand these games and franchises music and sound watch and i think it's 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 been just on the rise which is great and i think it's an opportunity for play or for developers to really brand their game into um something more iconic than something with more anemic audio okay so i've got two things first First, first question, have you ever worked on a horror game before? And the second is, I, I'm a 3D animator. And so after I was in school for a while and animating, it's like my perception of animated movies had changed. And it was more about, I was just like checking out every detail of the animation, you know, like if they did this right or if they did that right, or comparing like one scene to the next to see if like the same animator did it, you know? Yeah, and yeah, so, yeah, yeah. I would imagine, and this, I guess, is the question. So since you are so deep into that with that mindset, when you watch a movie or watch a video game, is this whole, like, you're, you're breaking apart the audio in in the back of your mind or in the front of your mind or whatever? And does, do you think it takes away from enjoyment of the actual experience? Uh, first question, have we worked on a horror game? Yes, we've done a number of horror games. Last year, we a Legacy, which is an awesome the game um so very horror focused and and as you know to segue into do i listen differently i think yes i try not to um i try to let myself be immersed but of course you pay attention to certain things um you know if i hear music or sound that i'm like huh i don't love what happened there or that just doesn't sound I right never, it's, it's not in the right space right. Yeah. i never blame the audio people at this point because i used to be like oh that sounds terrible look what i fucked up but now i'm like <laughs> wow the audio team got screwed by something they so you know it's usually like oh like 
they didn't want to do a great job there or just made a terrible decision. Oftentimes it was like, oh, you know, time was super crunched or budget was super crunched or animations changed after and no one told them or God knows what happened. So if I do hear anything like that I don't love, I'm always like, oh, poor audio team. They got they got screwed. Oh, you know what? That's It's them. funny because I would do that. I would see games that I see and I'm like, the animation is terrible. So I go through and I'd look and I'd be like, oh, I know these animators, you know, and I know they're amazing animators. I'm like, ah, they just didn't they didn't have the budget. For the whole thing, you know what I mean. So they they had to exactly. make as take as many short paths as they could, and that's why that stuff looked like crack. And I actually it know happened. that that happened because I had worked on a game, and they wanted like a walk cycle, and basically he paid me for an hour, and so I just busted <laughs> it out as as fast as I could. And man, it was I mean it was a walk cycle, but man, it was not like my pinnacle of look at look at this animation that I did, you know, because oh. It was brutal, but yeah, that's awesome. It happens, you know, it's the reality and I get it. But yeah, I do listen differently, but I, I also, you know, you gotta, you gotta temper it. Yeah. <laughs> Is that Here's funny? Your walk cycle. It's, it's three frames of animation. Enjoy. Three frames. <laughs> One step. Well, Richard, I wholly appreciate you coming on here. We've got your website. We'll put that up there. You know, all of this is going to be online and, and you're going to be re recorded for posterity. You know, now you're famous. Fun. Okay. Yeah, now, now. Not for your accomplishments, now. but for being on the show. Yes, exactly. <laughs> right. We, it's, it's our 14 viewers here that, you know, absolutely make or break your, it's true. Your, your, your studio day in and day out. Uh, so, I mean, to everyone listening, if you have questions, we're on, uh, Richard's on our Discord, and I just posted the Discord up there, so you can hop in there, ask questions, you know, poke, prod, you know, we're always happy to help where we can. Um, Andy, what else we got going on? Oh, um, I would be like, you know, if you know any, any, if you needed any voice actors, sweetie, I've got a few <laughs> characters that, uh... <laughs> <laughs> A tale as old as time. Yeah. If you ever need audio. If you ever need, yeah. Or I, you know what? I've got a great idea for a video game. Oh my god. Yes. Again, why I tell people on airplanes, I sell insurance. Mm -hmm. Um. All right. And so <laughs> we've got. You know, we haven't announced the official dates yet, but we are going to have our inaugural uh, indie game business micro conference networking. So uh, the completely arbitrary Bitly link that I just threw up in chat. Uh, pop on it, take two minutes. It's five questions. We're just trying to get a very good idea of what people want to get out of a conference like that, where you can go and, and you can meet folks like, like Richard, or you find you a publisher or all of that sort of good stuff. Uh, we're going to be doing that in the next couple of months. And so we're looking for feedback there. That's always appreciated. And, and if you want to make sure that it takes five minutes, just download toggle on your phone toggle. and then yes. press that button when you start exactly. filling out the questions. And then you can come back and go, Jay, that took 20 minutes. I'm like, well, you know, five questions are hard sometimes. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's it. That's I, I know Richard's got a roll. We got a roll too. Um, thank you so much, man. We highly appreciate it. And we've Thanks got the- Thanks for hearing about audio. It's always great to see people talking about it because I know it's the bastard child of the industry, um, but it's awesome. No, that's not true. QA and testing is the bastard child of the air. Ah, no, they're the heroes. They're the heroes. They're the heroes. They should be the heroes, but they're not. They're, they're, they're the ones that constantly get, and, and marketing, you know, the whole, my game's done and now I need a marketing plan, but I have no budget for it. You know, that's the, um, that's the other side of it. So, and you'll be at GDC and Game Connection, correct? Yeah, yeah, we're up at GDC for sure. Um, I think most people, Hex. That's what we need. We need a GDC indie game business booth. GDC. Well, we may have one. Where we It'll broadcast over live. $80,000, you we, can buy one. Yeah, we yeah, broadcast there's... live from there and then just interview people. I love it. You know what? We could probably do that. I know. Not, not, not on the Moscone th Center floor, but over at the um, at the other venue with Meet to Match. Yes, that's a possibility. That oh, would be awesome. We you, could set up and, you know. Are you, are you going to lug your rig down to San Francisco? I, I mean, I, I have a laptop that would actually work really well for it. Because yeah. I just bought that brand new laptop. Right, sure. 
what is it? We'll, we'll look into that and i mean right. really we do it set up a couple cameras or one camera and then the u.s the blue yeti bam we're done good to go the blue yeti the blue oh. yeti no i'm just kidding I'm no just kidding. no it's it's, it's they're great for just on the go you know you carry I'm it with totally you kidding. i'm totally kidding Sometimes people come to us and they're like, oh, I've got a great That mic. is the bastard the child of the mic. <laughs> it weighs like eight pounds. It's mm -hmm. like, how do you mean it's good to go? This thing is heavy as all get out. It's good if you get mugged in San Francisco. You swing that at somebody. And you're wow. Yourself. My blue Yeti. Mm -hmm. All righty. Richard, we'll let you get to your meeting. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank um, you. Yeah, have a great rest of your day and uh, appreciate you having me. All right. Yeah, our pleasure, dude. Bye, Thanks. everybody. Thank See you Friday. Well, oh, what do we got Friday, yeah. Jay? I have no idea. What's up? Why are you asking me these questions? You Greg know everything. Gonna be, uh, Greg and Don, the director of publishing for Hot Hit, he's going to be talking about their new Ooh. publishing initiative. Uh, we'll probably be talking more about some casual games and monetization a little bit too, because Greg has got some good ideas on how other ways that we can monetize things. And then next week on Wednesday, we're going to have my good friend Elizabeth, who's got a new platform coming out to it's ads but it's not ads it's it's ways that studios can monetize their games with goodness with That's goodness instead can, of yeah. instead of negativity exactly instead of you know all let's you know whatever shooter is out today you know all of the the ads and the promotions that go through their platform are all charitable wonderful organizations you're actually doing some good for the world um, nice you know, with your game by doing that and she's going to be on and then next friday we're going to have uh jason de la roca talking about you know something that's near and dear to everyone's heart funding and how you get you know should you be looking at project funding or equity funding and and all of that sort of stuff jason is one of the absolute top tier experts in the industry nice. when it comes to that sort of stuff that'll be so, an interesting show both of those will be interesting like i've been doing some work on the side you man know? we have some like phone calls bam this and then this, and then completely you know that's awesome our guests are just like it's not just like one main thing it's all of these different things it's it's amazing well we can, i'm excited we can do that to my add you know it's like mm -hmm. oh let's talk about this Ooh, squirrel. <laughs> coffee <All right. laughs> All right, everyone. All right, everybody. The music is by Popsky and Big Lich. That's what we're playing. No copyright strikes, baby, because we got permission. <laughs> are we going to get flagged on YouTube again? Mm -mm. All right. We are not. And if we do, I know them both personally. So the good news is we, we have an audio expert that we can go to now, too, as well. Mm -hmm. I'm going to oh, tell them we have no budget, though. Glitch says, let me just say that I strongly enjoy this weekly show, even as a content creator. Awesome. Thank you. Well, thank you. Well, we have fun doing it. It's, it's, it's different than my daily today today's live streaming we, characters on atlas <laughs> we have to have fun doing it because it's not like we're getting making any money doing mm. it so you know we, we have to have fun all right everybody we're out of here see you uh take care everybody friday hey stay warm if you're anywhere like me or wear shorts like me or yeah